All right. In the year 1519, as the conquistadors were in Mexico, Central America, they were landing and they had a problem because a lot of them wanted to go back. And Cortez decided that the only way to tell them that they were there to stay was burn the ships. So he burned all of their ships and they had no choice but to stick it out. There's an old saying that if you have a plan B, plan A loses its value, it loses its focus. If you have a, a, a way out, you're not going to put as much energy into the, the original plan. You have to have a, a plan to start with. That was when God sent the exiles into uh, Babylon. He said to them, hey, no plan B. You're not going back. Stick it out. Pray for this place. Pray for it to succeed, because if it succeeds, you will succeed. And that's what you want to do. You want to keep going. And that's one of the problems that we have is we always, as humans, are working on our plan B. And I think some of that plays out in uh, our own lives as we're following Jesus, because our plan Bs are sometimes our jobs, our bank accounts, or things like that. So we're going to dive back into the Gospel of Mark. Uh, we've been studying the book, or we have begun to study the Gospel of Mark this year, and our verse is Mark chapter 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And we're just going to dig in and dig in and dig in to this idea that not only the king of kings, but God himself did not come to be served. That should shock us. I think we've, we've, we've kind of gotten used to the idea of the servant king, but the reality of what that really, really, really means, God, the creator of heaven and earth became one of us so that he could serve us. That should blow us, blow our minds. It's not the way humans work, and it normally isn't the way the gods of the world work. But the God, our creator, is uh, the one who designed that this is the upside down way that his kingdom is going to work. Again, I want to challenge you to memorize that verse and you know put it on your fridge or, or whatever it takes for you to be focusing on what that means. Because if he is the king, then what does that make us? What do we, what do, we do if he is the king and he serves? How does that play out for us? Last time we spoke about serving our neighbors. And uh, how did that go? Anybody get to prayer walk their neighborhood yet? Have any neighbors or colleagues or someone, uh, if not a legit neighbor or an actual neighbor, somebody else that God put in your life that he wanted you to serve? Any stories, challenges from last week? Keep on it. <laughs> I'm going to keep challenging you. That's where God put you, and that's what he put you there for. Yeah, Deanne? So the Lord showed you in a window into there how you might. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Anybody else? Okay. Keep that in mind. I want you to keep remembering that. So the book of Mark, as we studied, opens with a statement of uh, of of belief. The first three verses of Mark, Mark 1 through 3. That's not working. So can you put it on 3? It's not working on your side either. All right. So we'll get there eventually. Mark 1 through 3, it says, The beginning of the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Yeah, it's on you version, by the way. You can follow if you want a new version. Of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Messiah is the uh, the anointed one. The Son of God, which again talks about his relationship with the Father. And it continues, as is written or prophesied in Isaiah the prof by Isaiah the prophet. But as we discovered last time, it's not just Isaiah. It's all the prophets. And Isaiah just stands as the first of the prophets that, that he talks about. So then uh, Mark Chapter 1, verse 4, the next 12 verses of that passage. There we go. 
uh, introduced us to who Jesus was uh, in that. If he's the son of God, who was he? So we saw his baptism. We saw his temptation as he succeeded in wandering through the wilderness for 40 days. And what those two things showed us is that he is the true Israelite, that the Israelites were baptized in the Red Sea and they were uh, they wandered for 40 years in the, the desert or 40 years in the desert, not 40 days in the desert. And uh, they failed in the mission that God had called them to, which is why they ended up wandering for 40 years. But Jesus actually succeeded in that and was baptized. So he went through that to prove that he was the true Israelite. And then that passage ended with both John's imprisonment and the statement of the beginning of Jesus's ministry in verse 14, which is where we're going to pick up the story this morning. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And again, that repentance, this is, again, I'm just closing up from last time. That repentance is not change what you're doing. It's change what you're believing. Stop worshiping a false God that, that allows you to live the life that you're living and worship the true God that expects you to live a life that is honoring to him. Pick it up in verse 16. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, and they were fishermen. That's going to be a fun little, tells you where this one is going. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I want you to highlight or circle or whatever you're comfortable with in your Bible of that follow me, because that follow me is going to be the message of the book of Mark. That's what Mark is trying to convince you to do is to follow Jesus. So we're going to see not only him calling people, but then he's going to give you the why. And so Mark is going to challenge us to do the same thing. He's going to come up later in, uh, in chapters uh, eight and 10, as he says, take up your cross and follow me twice. He's going to say that. So it's not just follow me and everything will be rosy, but take up your cross, which means be ready to give up your life uh, and, and die to yourself. Verse 18 says, and immediately, uh, you may want to remember I talked about two weeks ago when talked about Mark has this sense of urgency. Almost every sentence in Mark's gospel begins with the word and he's trying to push us along as if there's there's this there's urgentness to it. And so you're going to see this word immediately. In other words, like that, they're going to happen a lot. Pay attention. I, I challenge you even just in this one passage here in chapter one to highlight the ands and the urgent, the timing uh, and see how quickly this happens. And I'll highlight them as we go. So immediately they left their nets and followed him and going to a little further, he saw James and John, the son of Zebedee, his James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother who were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them and they left their father in the boat and hired servants, followed him. You get the implication. There's no statement of immediately, but if they left their father in the boat, that's immediate. They didn't, you know, there was a kind of a left. And the Nets, again, I think most of you know, the Nets is their career. And so they had to, they were choosing to leave what they knew and what was going to provide income, the thing that was keeping them safe and secure and was their only way of, of making a living. But it was also the excuses that was holding them back. So in, a, in, a, in an interesting picture, Jesus is saying, your Nets are holding you. And you need to let go of your nets in order to catch others. You're going to, he makes this contrast there. They're being trapped in their own nets as their careers. In order to be freed, they have to let go of what is entrapping them in order to catch others with the gospel. And so, and then they went to Capernaum. So remember we talked this summer, we talked about where the city of Capernaum is. And uh, actually, oh, there it is right on the screen. Uh, Capernaum was hometown to James and John, and we'll find out later, Matthew, they were from that area. Remember, Peter and Andrew, brothers, were from Bethsaida, but Peter also has a house in Capernaum. Why? Because his mother-in-law lives in Capernaum. And um, so, uh, and probably more importantly to this whole thing, and maybe how this is all tied together, is if you look at that uh, right along that road that goes along there, the Via Maris goes all the way down from Egypt. That is the trade route. It is the, uh, it, was, it wasn't called the Silk Road. It was, there's another route for it, the, the Great Trunk Road that went from Egypt and Africa, really, all the way up into Syria and then went to Europe and Asia from there. So everything came through. This is, this is the road through the mountains. This is where they would go. So uh, notice the Capernaum's on there and Bethsaida is there. So these are the two little towns. Um, they're not just two little backwaters. 
they're the place where um, not only Jews are traveling by, but Egyptians are traveling by, and Romans are going to travel by, and Greeks and Phoenicians and Syrians. Yes. Yes, we walked. That was the road we drove on. It's actually a road now. And so uh, we walked, we drove on that road. Yes, exactly. So um, this is, it, it's an international highway. And this is going to play out in maybe why Jesus chose this town. Uh, the other thing that's the, that's really important between the two towns is see that river that's in between them, uh, where the Ann and Chorazin is between Bethsaida and Capernaum. Do you see the road? Can you see the road? So that river is also the division between two kingdoms two of Herod's kids. And so if Jesus, things got hot in one kingdom, he can go to cross the river and be in somebody else's territory. It's kind of like crossing county lines so that the cops can't get you on the other side. And so it was an easy place. If things got hot, he can go from one side to another. And, and, uh, and it was a very strategic place for the bee. Also, and we talked about this a while ago, within a couple hours, you can be, you know, in various directions, multiple cities. And, and so lots of people can quickly travel on this road and either go news can, about Jesus can get out, but also people are like, I need to go see this Jesus for myself. And so they can make the travel to get in there. So they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. Uh, again, here is the synagogue of Capernaum. This is built. If you'll notice the very bottom layer is darker stone. That darker stone is the synagogue that Jesus would have taught in. The one above is one that replaced it and they built on top of it. So it's the same size, same shape, same location, but a different, uh, a newer building was built on top. So this is the place. There's no, no question that this is the place that these stories that we're about to read happened within this building as you stand there. And so uh, they entered into the synagogue and he, um, and was teaching. Uh, again, it was not a church. There were no congregations. There were no churches at that time. Uh, they were Jewish. Churches didn't exist yet. Verse 22 says, and they, who were they that would be in a synagogue? Of course, the Jews. But but it's not just the local Jews. This is a pretty rich place, right? You can tell it took some money to build this place. This is on the trade route. So if you're a, a Jew that's traveling from one place to another and on your trade business and you're on a Sabbath and you come, you're in Capernaum, you'd visit here. So you have local Jews, you have Jews that are traveling, but you also have God-fearing Jews and people who have not converted to Judaism because they don't want to be circumcised. They don't want to go through all that kind of stuff, but they believe in this monotheistic view of God and they believe in the teachings of uh, that they're finding in the Torah. They sit in there as well. So you have this, this uh, crowd that's there that are gathering. And, and watch for this phrase, because this is going to play out, because right up to now, we've got Peter, James, Andrew, uh, John. Those are the guys that we've talked about so far, right, in, in this. But this is going to move very quickly from this very small group to crowds and people. And uh, so watch how the numbers play out in this. As this popularity gr grows right now, it's just, you know, those that are attending church service in this or a worship service on a Sabbath in this building. That was the size of his following at that point. And it wasn't even his following. His followers were in the building with everybody else, but that's all that it was. And watch how quickly that changes. Uh, but it was in this building, which is really an amazing thing. Verse 22, and they were astonished at his teaching. Uh, why were they amazed? For he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes, not as the Torah teachers, the teachers of the law. We're going to find out that Jesus amazes two people in two different ways. One is with his miracles. We're going to see that happen, but we're also going to see it in his teaching. And part of that is we know that we've experienced that in our own lives, but his teaching amazed them for several reasons. One, because of his insight, he was able to see scripture and, and the law in ways that they have never been taught before. And, and by his authority, as he taught these things, since the Babylonian captivity, do you remember why they were sent on the, in captivity in Babylon? because they weren't keeping the law. So when they got to Babylon, it scared the bejeebers out of them. And they were like, we're going to keep the law if it kills us. And so they became very legalistic about the law. And so they had these rabbis and these scribes that were writing like, this is what this means. This is how you play this out, which becomes 635 laws that they have to follow. And, and you've heard about all that kind of legalism. So these scribes 
uh, that live in every town and, and uh, are the ones that kind of interpret the rabbis and who interpreted scripture. And this is how this plays out. And you're not doing it. And so they had authority. Not They were the ones who had the, the high seat in the synagogue. There are special seats in the synagogue that they would have sat in. But you had to be a scribe, actually, to be in the Jewish Senate in Jerusalem. So these literally, not only were they religious leaders, but they were the authority. They were the political authority for them as well. And so um, the the uh, they were not just spiritual authorities. They were civic authorities as well. But, the, but their rulings came from other rabbis. They didn't have authority in themselves. They could only had, a, had authority as long as they could prove it from another rabbi, that this is what a rabbi said, and so it was someone else's opinion. Matthew Henry, one of the commentators, said that Jesus taught as one that knew the mind of God and was commissioned to declare it. One who knew the mind. He didn't need to know the mind of a rabbi. He didn't need to know the mind. He knew the mind of God himself. Think about the implications of that. He didn't quote other rabbis. Nowhere in Jesus' teachings do you hear him quoting other rabbis, which is what the scribes did. That's how they got their authority. Well, I follow Rabbi Hillel or I follow Gamaliel. So they would, in their teachings, they would, that's how they got their authority. I'm a follower of him or I'm a follower of him. And this is what we should believe. Jesus never did that. If you want to hear about how he taught, look at the Sermon on the Mount. It's a great place to, to, he never once in there quotes anybody else. He just tells you. And so there's an authority that comes from his teaching that uh, one commentator said he expected others to see his teaching as superseding the poor translations of the scribes and rabbis. His teaching, he wanted you to look at them and say, no, 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 that's, that doesn't count. That's not good. His teachings put him in a whole different, it's the scribes and the and the teachers, and it's Jesus. It, it created this whole, the way he taught with authority, created a whole new place that people had not experienced. And that's why it amazes them. And verse 23 says, and immediately, there's another immediately, there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Who, who, how does, what does he, what does it mean? The Holy one, the Holy again means separate, unique, set apart. Jesus is one who is different from everyone else. He is uh, unique and set apart for God's purposes. Verse 25, but Jesus rebuked him and said, be silent and come out of him. Now this is super important because we're going to see this over and over specifically in Mark's gospel. And it's, it can be puzzling at times because after a miracle, after a sermon, after a um, you know, a light bulb goes on with someone, he's going to say, okay, now don't tell anybody, which you would think in our Western evangelistic mindset that you'd want to tell everybody. So why is he doing this? Well, first of all, a testimony from a demon seems powerful, but that's not what Jesus wanted. This thing is called what's been called for the past couple hundred years, the messianic secret. He doesn't hide his power. He doesn't hide his purpose. He doesn't hide his authority, but he tells people not to tell other people about it, which is really interesting. He does claim to be the son of man, and he didn't want demons to be the ones. So part of that is he doesn't want demons to be the ones that reveal who he is, because if it's coming from a demon, are you sure you can trust it? So he was limiting his fame so that he had time to teach all the things that he needed to teach, because guess what happened? People, he know, he'll know he tell us, his specific tells us in the book of John that he knew in their hearts that they wanted to make him the king. So he withdrew, right? So he knew that the people were rushing. They were not, they didn't have patience for his plan to work out. So he had to, you know what, have you ever, um, one of the things when you cook pasta, right? And if you put the lid on top of it, all of a sudden it boils over. And the only way to kind of make sure it doesn't boil over is to kind of move the lid a bit and you regulate the, the pressure within the pot so that it doesn't, it still has time to cook while it does its job without making a mess on your stove. That's kind of what's happening here. He's regulating the steam, the pressure that's there so that he has time to get his message out, not only to the world, because the, the world wants to rush him straight to, to becoming king, uh, but also to his disciples who over and over and over again in three years of ministry, they don't get it, they don't get it, they don't get it, they don't get it. So he needs time for his teaching to, to kind of percolate in their lives so he has time to teach them. And and his fr- fame quickly, I mean, we see this on TikTok, you see it on the news even these days, uh, that when it gets out there too fast and it gets out of control, it brings people to false conclusions. 
And so one of the false conclusions is that Jesus is the king and he's going to kick out the Romans, which is not what his purpose was at all. But that's the way people make their own interpretations of what's going on and they come to conclusions and it's not the right one. So it gave him the time by relieving the pressure, by going to different places, by crossing the rivers, by going to different little small towns and continuing to travel rather than have people come always to one place, gave him the time to let his teachings percolate with, especially with his disciples, because those are the ones that are going to take the message after this. Verse 26 continues, and the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him and they were all amazed and they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits that they obey him. So he's already shown that he has authority over the Torah because he's teaching in a brand new way, in a way that no one else has seen before, but he even has authority over the spirit world. And he's proving his authority over the Torah by the fact that he has authority over the spirit world. Verse 28. And at once, there you go, there's that quickly, immediately again, his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. How does that happen? They're on that main trade route. And so people that had been traveling through town, they weren't in there for any specific reason, but they're coming from Syria. They're heading to Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, like, they stop at the next end. You should have seen what I just saw in Capernaum, or they're going the opposite direction. You should have just seen what I just saw in Capernaum. You should have heard this guy's teaching. You should see the crowds. He's healing people. He's doing, and this news begins to spread. And some people are like, well, I need to go see this for myself. And they go back the other way. So, and again, it's at that international crossroads and it's very easy to get back and forth. Verse 29, and immediately, again, He's, he's pushing us along. He left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John across the street from the synagogue. Okay, so look at this building. This is the synagogue across the street from the synagogue. Look how close that is. Now, that's a big, ugly church that's been built over the top of it. It has glass floors so you can see down inside of it. But archaeologically, they know that this was the house of Peter, Peter's mother-in-law. And it, uh, the walls are interesting because it started out as this very small house, and then they had to make it bigger, then they had to make it bigger, and they had to make it bigger. So there's these concentric circles of construction that go around, around this building. So it's there. So right across the street from the synagogue is where the rest of the story happens. Um, now, Simon's mother-in-law lay with a fever, and immediately they told him about her, and he came and took her over by the hand and lifted her up and the fever left her and she began to serve him instantly. Isn't that interesting how, so, you know, if, sometimes if you've been sick for a while, you've had a cold or a flu, you get over it. You still, it takes a couple of days to get your energy back, get your strength back and stuff like that. But she's strong enough that immediately Jesus didn't just heal the sickness. He also got her back on her feet again as he went. She had full strength to begin serving them right away. Verse 32, that evening at sundown, I mean, we're not even getting through a whole day here and all this stuff is happening. They brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons. How many people in town were coming to his house? Everybody. They already saw, he already cleaned. If he's, if he's got that kind of teaching, if he's got that kind of power over demons, this is my chance. So they bring everybody. Can you imagine if we realized how many people around us were oppressed by demons and that their sicknesses was something that Jesus could heal? Uh, that day wasn't even, uh, again, wasn't even over. And they come to Peter's house and the whole city was gathered at the door right outside the synagogue. Um, and again, remember I told you almost every sentence starts with the end. It gets a little uh, repetitive here if you, if you ask me. And he healed many who were sick with diseases and cast out many demons. Highlight the word many in your in your version that's there. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Again, first, there's that messianic mystery again. He's keeping the he's keeping the pressure off the pot so that it doesn't boil over too fast. But the thing to notice here is that he didn't heal everybody. Everybody came, said that, specifically says that. All the people came, but he didn't heal. He healed many, but he didn't heal all of them. Um, he healed say, some of them because that was part of the message of the kingdom. Some of them needed to be saved, but he didn't heal everybody because some of them needed to continue to be sick again for the sake of the kingdom. It was for the same purpose. Sometimes it's in our sickness that God uses it for the glory of his kingdom. It's not, it's for the very same reason that some people are healed and some people are not. Sometimes our sickness does more for the sake of kingdom than our healing would. And, and that's up to God to determine. And that's where we have to leave it. 
and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark. Again, here's the, you know, the time keeps, he's, he's clicking off the time here. Very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus departed and went out to a desolate place and he prayed. Isn't that a beautiful thing? In the midst of the chaos of all that's going on there, Jesus is. And why does he do that? If Jesus and the Father are one, why does he need to go spend time with his Father? Aren't they always together? And this is one of those things that we wrestle with when we try to understand the humanity and deity of Jesus. And I said this a couple weeks ago or last week. Jesus, in operating, uh, in order to be our Messiah, in order to be qualified for our Messiah, had to operate completely in his humanity. He could not at any point access his deity to do things without the permission of his Father. So if he is completely human, he doesn't know all things at all times. The father reveals to him what needs to be revealed. So as he's healing the sick, the many, how did he know who to heal? He doesn't, well, didn't go around touching people. His father said, that person, that person. Remember the woman who came to him and touched his robe? Jesus didn't know. The father knew. He turned around and said, who did that? So as he's going around, he's operating out of his humanity. How does he know who the father wants him to heal? Because he goes and has this quiet time alone with the Lord. He goes and he has this. He said in John chapter 5, John chapter 14, John chapter 8, he says, I only do what the father tells me to do. Jesus' actions throughout his ministry were not because he wanted to or even that he could. It's only because his father told him to do it. I will tell you, I believe that Jesus couldn't have walked on water any day he wanted to. He only walked on water the day his father told him to. And the disciples did everything that Jesus did. Peter walked on water. Now he, you know, ended up failing at that, but he ended up, he started out walking on water. They raised people from the dead. They healed people from, people from their sicknesses. Jesus only did what the father guided him to do as he could show us what a life living in obedience to the father could accomplish. And the only way that Jesus knew what the father wanted was he spent quiet time alone with the Lord. Uh, verse 36. And Simon and Simon, again, here's, he's moving the story along. And those who were with him were searching for him. They found him and said, hey, everybody's looking for you. Where are you? And Jesus said to him, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also. That is why I came out. So the father says, hey, Jesus, you need to you need to get a move on because this is getting a little too crowded. You need to go find another small town somewhere and you need to share the, the news that way. So again, he's letting off the steam off that pot and he's going to some of these smaller villages so he can share the message. So he went to, throughout all the Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. Notice he's not hiding his authority. He's just going to smaller places so more and more people can know him. And it's less less about the show and more about getting the message out to the people. And a leper came to him, imploring him and kneeling to him and said, if you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and he touched him and he said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent, to him, sent him away at once. Now, before we get, you know, okay, so let me read this first, first. Verse 44, and he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone and go show yourself before the priest, offer them clean, the cleansing that Moses commanded for proof to them again. So again, that mysterious warning, verse 45, but he went out and he began to freely talk about it and spread the news. So before we get critical of this guy, if you had leprosy and couldn't hang out with your friends or family, your neighbors, and had to live in the edge of town, and all of a sudden you didn't, do you think you could keep that quiet? No. Right. All of a sudden you can hug your kids again. You can hug your family. You can move back into your house. You can be a part of the community. I mean, this is beyond, this isn't just getting your, your blister on your finger healed. This is, this is almost being resurrected from the dead for this guy. So before we get too critical about the fact that he didn't know, he could have gone into the temple and done those things. But at the same time, he's like, I'm healed. I'm healed. And I'm sure he went, he didn't go to the, straight to the temple. I'm sure he went straight to his family. Wouldn't you? You haven't hugged your family in maybe decades. And all of a sudden you can touch their cheeks and you can cry with them and you can hug with them and you can take naps with them and all those things you can do as a family. 
So, but he went out and began to talk freely about it and spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the town, but was in desolate places. And the people were coming to him from every quarter. Jesus was in desolate places. He was trying to get away from people. And yet, guess what? It started in that synagogue with just a few people believing. And all of a sudden, within one chapter, three stories, all of a sudden, he's more popular than the Beatles. Whatever the Beatles may say about being more popular than Jesus, he's got people clamoring. We're going to see through rooftops to come and to see him. So now what? What does follow me mean to you? What nets are holding you back? What's the plan B that you're holding on to just in case Jesus doesn't do it for you? Just in case he doesn't heal you, just in case he doesn't pay your, you know, bank account off or pay those bills that you need to pay. Um, again, Jesus didn't heal everyone. And, and that's hard for some of us to comprehend because we're all like, well, why not me? Why am I not the one? Why did that person got healed and not me? And, and maybe we don't see the power of God because we're still holding on to our nets. We're still holding on to plan B. And what he wants us to do is let go of those things that ironically we're using to catch others, but really what it's done is it's caught us. And we need to let go of those nets in order for him to free us so that he can bless us. If Jesus only did what the father told him to do, that meant his obedience, uh, his authority came from his obedience. So what, how does that play out for us? Are we being obedient? When you're, when are you cultivating your life, the voice of God, so that you can hear, so that you know how to be obedient? Sometimes I think we're taking our nets and say, God, here, use this. Here, use this. Use this. Lord, this is what's in my hand. Use this. And he's saying, let it go and let me do what I want to do. And I'll use a different kind of nets. So what is the obedience that God is calling you today so that you can follow him? So you can follow plan A and only plan A and never need a plan B. Father, we need courage. The, the nets are in our hands and they're so easy to trust in because they've done their job. We know how they work. To let go of them and to follow, sometimes we have to do things we don't understand and to go places we didn't, don't know about. Following you is new territory. Do you give us courage, please, today? There are nets that each of us are holding. I know that I'm holding, that I need to let go of. Reveal them to us and give us courage to let them go. In your son's name, amen.